Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weyenberg. This time, we will continue our reading of Over the Gate by Miss Reed. Chapter 2. Strange but True? Poor Fred Hurst died a fortnight before Christmas, and Mr. Willett, who is sexton of St. Patrick's as well as caretaker of Fairacre School, had the melancholy task of digging his grave. We could hear the ring of his spade as it met sundry flints embedded in the chalk only a foot or so below the surface of the soil. It was a dark gray December afternoon outside, but within the classroom was warmth, color, and a cheerful hum as the children made Christmas cards. Above their bent heads swung the paper chains they had made. Here and there a pendant star circled slowly in the keen drafts which play constantly between the Gothic windows at each end of the school building. A fir branch cut from the vicarage garden leant in a corner, giving out its sweet resinous breath as it awaited its metamorphosis into a glittering Christmas tree. Crayons stuttered like machine guns as snow scenes were created. Reindeer with colossal antlers, which took up far too much room, tottered on legs, inevitably short, across the paper. Robin's fattest footballs stood on tiptoe. Father Christmas, all boots and whiskers, appeared on every side at once. Holly, Christmas puddings, bells, and stars flowed from busy fingers throughout the afternoon. And every now and then, during the rare quiet pauses in their activity, we could hear the distant sound of Mr. Willett at his work in the desolate solitude of an empty grave. The wintered afternoon was merging into twilight when the children shouted and skipped their way homeward from Fairacre Village School. Mr. Willett, coming from the churchyard next door, propped his spade against the lich gate and paused to light his pipe. In the murk, his wrinkled countenance was illumined, standing out against the dark background like a Rembrandt portrait. Hands cupped over the bowl of his pipe, he squinted sideways at me. Finished your day, I suppose, he commented. Nice work being a school teacher, he added mischievously. What about you, I retorted. Mr. Willett flung back his head and blew a fragrant blue cloud into the mist around him. Got your plaguey coke to sweep up now I've dug poor old Fred's last bed, he answered equably. He reached for the spade with a massive muddy hand. My kettle's on, I said. Come and have a cup of tea before you start again. Well now, said my caretaker, eyes brightening. I don't mind if I do, Miss Reed. I'm fair shrammed. Grave digging be mortal clammy work this weather. We strolled back together across the empty playgrounds to the schoolhouse. Here, I can't come in like this, protested Mr. Willett at the kitchen door, all cagged up with mud. What'll old Miss, Mrs. Pringle once say when she comes to wash your floor? No more than she says every week. This house is the dirtiest in the village, so she tells me. Miserable old faggot, Mr. Willett smiled indulgently. How she do love a good moan. Still, this mud's a bit much, I will say. Give us a bit of newspaper and I'll have it under me boots. We settled in the warm kitchen, the tea tray between us on the table. We were both tired and cold and sipped the tea gratefully. It was good to have company, and Mr. Willow always had something new to impart. He did not fail me on this occasion. Poor old Fred Hurst, he mused, stirring his cup thoughtfully. I've got him right at the end of a row, next to the old bit of the churchyard. Funny thing, he's lying aside Sally Gray. Two fanciful ones together there, I reckons. Sally Gray. A querying tone of my voice stopped the spoon's rotation suddenly. Mr. Willett looked at me in astonishment. You don't tell me you ain't heard of Sally Gray. Been here all this time and Miss Sally? I nodded apologetically and pushed the fruitcake across to him to atone for my shortcomings. Mr. Willett waved it aside, his eyes wide with amazement. Can't hardly credit it. She's about the most famous person in Fairacre. Why, come to think of it, we had a young chap down from some magazine or other writing a bit about her. Before your time, no doubt. Nice enough chap, he seemed, although he had a beard. Mr. Willett checked himself, blew out his own thick walrus mustache, and resumed his tale. Well, beard, I calls it. Twasn't hardly that. More like one of those pan cleaners, the bristly ones, much the same color. 
for two pins I'd have advised him to have it off, but you knows how touchy young fellows get about their bits of whisker, and I was always one for peace. Civility costs nothing, my old ma used to say. She were full of useful sayings. I began to see where Mr. Willett got his own fund of maxims. No matter what the occasion, tragic or farcical, our caretaker come sexton at Fairacre always has some snippet of homely wisdom to fit the case. And what did he write? I prompt, edging him back toward the subject. Next to nothing when it come to it, Mr. Willett was disgusted. I thought at the time, watching him put down these ear twiddles and dots and dashes and that... Shorthand? I interpolated. Maybe, said Mr. Willett dismissively, but I thought at the time, as I were saying, that he'd never make head nor tail of that rigmarole, and I bet you, Quid, that's just what happened. You know why? Mr. Willett raised his teaspoon threateningly. After ta us talking to him, best part of a January afternoon up the churchyard there, with an east wind fit to cut the liver and the lights out of you, all he had to show for it was a measly little bit in the corner of a page. And most of that was a picture of the gravestone, what you could make out through the fog, that is, proper disappointment it was. Which paper, I asked. Some fiddle faddling thing they bring out other side of the country, not worth looking at. All about flowers and old ruins and history and that. Waste of time, really, and not a patch on the Caxley Chronicle. Mr. Willett drained his cup and set it carefully down on the saucer. Well, must be off to me coke sweeping, I suppose, he began to push his chair back. Not yet, I begged. You haven't told me a word about Sally Gray. Well, now, began Mr. Willett, weakening. I dare say the co could keep till morning, and I don't seem hardly right that you don't know nothing about our Sally. He watched me refill his cup without demur, rearranged his muddy boots on the newspaper, and settled with evident relish to his task of enlightenment. Sally Gray, Mr. Willett told me, died a good ten years or more before he was born, in 1890 to be exact, as her gravestone bore testimony, in her 63rd year. Consequently, as he pointed out, he was not speaking at first hand, although he could vouch for this strange story, for his mother and grandmother had both heard it from Sally's own lips during her final illness. Evidently, she had always been a funny little party, to quote Mr. Willett, she was the only child of elderly parents and was brought up in the end cottage of Tyler's Row. Her father was a carter, her mother took in washing, and the child grew up and used to hard work and little reward for great labor. Nevertheless, she was happy enough, although the other children in the village found her prim and shy and tended to tease her. She was small of stature, so that she was called Mouse by the boys, and dressed in cut-me-downs of her mother's, which gave her a ludicrous dowdiness, which invited the ridicule of the girls. No doubt her primness and shyness were the outcome of this treatment. Her greatest joy was in reading, which she mastered at an early age. Books were scarce, but tattered volumes cast out from the vicarage nursery came her way, and gave her endless pleasure. Sometimes a newspaper became available, and she read the account of Victoria's coronation to her parents, to their wonder and pride. When she was twelve or so, she entered into service at the Pars, a well-to-do family who lived in a Queen Anne house at the end of the village. She was quick and neat, obedient and dutiful, and gave satisfaction to the mistress of the house, and, more important still, to the housekeeper, who ruled the staff with a rod of iron. She lived in, as a matter of course, although only five minutes trot from her own home, but was often allowed to slip along the village street to see her family. Sometimes the cook gave her a bowl full of dripping or a stout marrowbone for the stockpot to eke out the meager commons of the Gray's diet. Sally was always careful to hide these tidbits under her cloak, safe from the eyes of the housekeeper or village gossips who might be encountered on the brief journey. Time passed. Housemaids came and went at the Parr's house, but Sally remained. Girls who had worked beside her, dusting, brushing stair carpets, carrying interminable cans of hot water to bedrooms, married and left. They showed their fat offspring to Sally in the fullness of time and commiserated with her about her state of spinsterhood. Sally did not appear to mind. She was as spry and nimble as ever, although a few gray hairs now mingled with the dark ones, and she continued to trot briskly about Fairacre. 
One bitterly cold winter, the two old greys fell desperately ill, and Sally asked leave to sleep at home and to work part-time at the Parr's. Mrs. Parr, who was an autocratic person, did not care for the idea. By now, Sally was a senior housemaid. It was she who carried in the early morning tea, pulled back the heavy curtains on their massive brass rings, and announced the weather conditions prevailing to her comatose mistress. She disliked the thought of someone else taking on these duties and told Sally that she must give it much consideration. However, Mrs. Parr knew full well that if she wished to keep Sally in her service, then there must be some slackening of the reins whilst the old people were in need, and graciously gave her consent. But understand, added the lady severely, you are to bring in the morning tea whenever it is humanly possible. Sally promised, obedient as ever, to do all in her power. For the next few months, she scurried between the great house and the little thatched cottage, and more often than not was early enough to take the tea to her mistress and prepare her for the return of consciousness. One summer morning, just before seven o'clock, she hastened by the dew-spangled shrubbery and was amazed to see the doctor's carriage outside the front door. In the kitchen, a woebegone staff, sketchily dressed, was with hair in curlers, poured forth the dramatic news. The master was dead. A heart attack, said the doctor, and mistress must be kept lying down to get over it. Within a month, poor Mr. Parr was buried. His widow was settled in France, and his son was directing the decoration and alteration of his heritage. To Sally's stupefaction, she found that she had been left the fabulous sum of 100 pounds by her late employer. Young Mr. Parr took her into Caxley and deposited it for her in the safety of a bank. The village was agog with the news. Sally's parents were beyond understanding her good fortune. Their days and nights were spent in fitful dozing, hovering between life and death, stirring occasionally to sup a bowl of gruel before sliding down thankfully upon the pillows again. In the thick of harvest time, as Fair Acre folk sweated beneath a blazing sun, they slipped away within three days of each other and were buried together not far from Mr. Parr's newly erected marble angel. Although she mourned her parents sincerely, there was no doubt that Sally's life now became very much easier she still worked for the new master, but lived at home, enjoying being mistress of her own small domain. Always an avid reader, she now had more time to indulge in this pleasure and often took a book in one hand and her candle in the other and made her way to bed before nine o'clock, there to read until St. Patrick's great clock struck midnight and the candle must be blown out. She had been given a pile of books from her dead master's library when things were being sorted out, and these were to keep her occupied in her leisure moments for many years to come. Contentment of mind, more rest, and plenty of good country air and food began to show their effect on Sally. Hitherto small and rather skinny, she now began to put on flesh, and soon became a little dumpling of a woman, albeit as quick on her feet as ever, despite a certain breathlessness. She was now well on in her forties, and her neighbors gave her no comfort. "'You're bound to put it on at your age,' said one. Be, "'Better be fat and happy,' said another, "'than a bag of bones.' "'You won't lose it now, my dear,' said a third smugly. "'Tis on for good when you put it on your time of life.' Sally was secretly nettled by this embarrassment of flesh. She let out seams, moved buttons, and unpicked waistbands, hoping in vain that one day she might revert to her former size. But the months grew into years, and Sally's bulk grew too. One sunny evening, she sat in her back porch with a very strange book in her hand. It was one of those bequeathed to her by her late master, a leather-covered exercise book which she had not troubled to open before. In it, she found a number of recipes written out in a crabbed, angular hand in ink which had faded to a dull brown. They were not particularly interesting to Sally. Cooking was not one of her major interests, and such household hints as a useful polish for ebonizing mahogany or a valuable amelioration for children's croup, which were also included in the book, did not stir her imagination. She yawned widely and was about to put the book away and prepare her simple supper when a heading caught her eye. It said, 
an infallible recipe for losing weight. Tilting the book to get the maximum light from the setting sun, Sally read with growing excitement. To be sure, some of the ingredients sounded perfectly horrid. A basin full of pig's blood beaten with a pound of honey, some goose grease and a plover's egg were bad enough, thought Sally, but when an impressive list of ground herbs moistened with cuckoo spit was to be added to it, then the concoction would surely be nauseating. Seal top of paste with pig's lard to exclude air, said the recipe, and added in capital letters, partake sparingly. Sally considered the page. Revolting it might be, but it was supposed to be infallible. The title said so. Would it be worth trying? She read the list of ingredients over again with close attention. The herbs would be easy to obtain, either from her own garden or the pars. Cuckoo spit glistened in all the meadows of Fairacre. Honey stood ready in its comb on her pantry shelf. Pig's blood and goose grease could be obtained fairly readily. The plover's egg would be the most difficult article to procure, but somewhere on the flanks of the downs which sheltered Fairacre, a boy's sharp eyes would be able to find a plover's nest, she felt sure. The biggest problem was the assembling of all these ingredients without arousing suspicion. There are no secrets capable of being hidden in a village, as Sally well knew. It was not that she feared ridicule alone. Within her time, she had seen old women ducked in the horse pond because their neighbors had suspected them of dabbling in witchcraft. And although the exercise book purported to be a straightforward recipe book, there was something suspiciously sinister about the weight-reducing recipe. Sally decided to go about her task with the greatest circumspection. Who knows, in a few months' time, she might have her trim, slim figure of youth. It was worth the trouble. All went well. Even the plover's egg was obtained with comparative ease from a shepherd boy who, carrying six eggs to her cottage in his cap, was glad to earn a silver sixpence. One evening after work, Sally prudently drew the curtain in her kitchen against prying eyes and set about making the paste. It smelt terrible and looked worse. It was yellowish-gray in color and speckled abominably with the ground herbs. Sally felt that she could not bring herself to taste it that evening, but would hope for strength in the morning. She retired to bed, with the reek of the concoction still in her nostrils. It looked singularly unattractive by morning light, but after breakfast, Sally put the tip of a spoon into the jar and bravely swallowed a morsel. I must do as it says and partake sparingly, she told herself as she washed the spoon. All that week, she continued the treatment. There seemed to be no result, but Sally was patient and, in any case, expected to wait some weeks before her bulk began to diminish. Sometimes she felt a slight giddiness a few minutes after swallowing the stuff, but when one considered the nature of the ingredients, this was hardly surprising. One morning, she decided to take a slightly larger dose. The clock on the mantel shelf told her it was later than usual, so that she flung the spoon in the washing-up bowl and set off at a brisk trot to the big house at the end of the village. She was perturbed to find that her gait was impaired. It seemed almost impossible to keep her heels on the ground, and Sally found herself tripping along on her toes, scarcely touching the ground at all. At the same time, giddiness occurred with some strength. Very strong stuff, thought Sally to herself. Small wonder once bid to partake sparingly. She took care to reduce the dose during the next week or two. By now it was high summer. Plumes of scented meadowsweet tossed by the roadside, and the bright small birds kept up a gay clamor as they flashed from hedge to meadow and meadow to garden. Sally tried on her summer print gowns with growing despair. They were as tight as ever. Buttons burst from the strained bodices and waistbands gaped as Sally strove in vain to ram her bulk into the protesting garments. Dratted stuff, hatted Sally. Never done me a harpeth of good. She surveyed herself in the small mirror, which she had tilted forward in order to get a better view of her figure. Exasperation flooded her bulky frame. It was no good. She would simply have to make new dresses. These had been let out to their furthest limits. She struggled out of the useless frocks, dressed in her former gown, and went sadly downstairs. 
The offending pot stood on the kitchen shelf. For two pins, exclaimed Sally aloud, I'd throw you where you belongs, out on the rubbish heap. She was about to bustle about her household chores when a thought struck her. Maybe I ain't been taken quite enough, thought Sally. It's worth trying. Today was the perfect day to make an experiment. It was Sunday, and she need not go out anywhere. If a giddy attack followed the taking of too much medicine, then she could simply lie down until she recovered. And if it do make me giddy, but it works, then it will be worth it, said Sally aloud. I can always take it at nights afore going to bed and sleep the giddiness off afore morning. She took a large spoon, dipped it deeply into the reeking mixture, and bravely downed it. For a moment, nothing happened apart from a slight feeling of nausea, which taking the stuff habitually gave her. And then, to Sally's horror and alarm, her feet left the ground and she began to rise steadily to the ceiling. She bumped her head against the central rafter with some violence and was about to scream loudly with combined pain and terror when Prudence checked her. Fine thing if the neighbors saw you now, she told herself severely. Look a proper fool, you would. She tried to quieten her panicky heart, and the fear of ridicule, as well as being suspected of witchcraft, helped to keep her tongue silent. It was uncomfortable and strange, bobbing loosely about the ceiling, trying to dodge the iron-hard rafter and the hanging oil lamp suspended from it. But Sally had always been of a philosophic strain and decided to make the best of a bad job. What can't be cured must be endured, quoted Sally, running a finger along the top of the white china lampshade. It was thick with dust, and Sally clucked disapprovingly at such filth in her house. No doubt about it, out of sight is out of mind. I must take this lot down and give it a real good wash in some suds. A pang seized her. If I ever do get down, she added despairingly. She propelled herself by pushing her hands against the ceiling until she was level with the high shelf where she stored bottling jars and preserving pans. To her horror, she saw a large black beetle dead and on its back in the pan she kept for making pickles and chutney. "'Tis really shameful," Scally, Sally scolded herself. "'If it hadn't been for this misfortune, I never would have realized what a slovenly fool I am." Below her, the potatoes waited in a bowl of water to be peeled, the cat mewed by his empty saucer, and the big black kettle on the oil stove began to hum. "'Locks,' thought Sally. "'How long do I have to stick up here, I wonder? Them dizzy turns went over in ten minutes or so. With any luck, I'll be down in half an hour.' Would the kettle boil over before then, she thought agitatedly. Really, it was too bad. It would teach her a lesson to go dabbling in things she didn't understand. She had realized, as soon as her head cracked against the beam, that she had misconstrued the heading of the recipe. She had indeed lost weight, but not size. It was only now, in the first half hour or so of her bizarre imprisonment, that she began to foresee the possibilities of her discovery. As a short woman, she had always found difficulty in reaching shelves and cupboards put into the cottage by her tall father. A stout stool accompanied Sally on many a job in the house, such as window cleaning and storing preserves, or the winter blankets in high, ill-used cupboards. If I takes just the right amount, pondered Sally, picking a particularly thick cobweb from the top of the curtains, I can float just where I need to. She began to dally with the idea of picking apples and plums without needing to borrow a ladder, but reason told her at once of the dangers. Too many prying eyes, decided Sally sagaciously, and dear knows how high I might go if the wind got me. It's got to be faced. I'm more like a balloon than anything else when I've got that stuff inside me. At that moment, she heard footsteps. Her front door stood open, as was its custom in fine weather, and this gave direct access to the living room. Luckily, the door between that room and the kitchen was securely shut. Sally edged her way, silently and painfully, to a shadowy corner of the ceiling. Her heart pounded. Would she be discovered? "'You in, my dear,' called her neighbor. Sally preserved a frozen silence." Be you upstairs, went on the voice. Sally heard the clang of the metal door scraper. Locks of mercy, what if she came in? 
Sally's throat dried at the very thought. She clung to the pan shelf with trembling fingers, praying with all her might. The kettle began to bubble steadily, and the cat jumped noisily on the table among the dishes. "'You home, Sal?' said the voice a little louder. The door scraper clanged again, then silence fell. At last there was sound of muttering and the slow fading of footsteps along the brick path to Sally's gate. Sally covered her face with her grimy hands and wept with relief. Ten minutes later, her body began to feel more solid and manageable. She found she could control the direction of her arms and legs with growing accuracy, and slowly she sank groundward. The first thing she did was to make a good strong pot of tea and carry it into the living room to recover. The fine cabbage, obviously brought by her neighbor, waited on the threshold. She must go and thank her when her legs stopped trembling and explain that she must have been down the garden when she called. Meanwhile, sipping and thinking, Sally regained her composure and turned over in her mind the best way of making use of the secret and surprising accomplishment with which she was now endowed. And we'll follow Sally's adventures further next time.